Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Grant Thornton webinar in collaboration with Kaplan and Drysdale on U.S. tax compliances for Americans living in India. A very good evening to all our attendees joining in from India and good morning to all our friends tuning in from the U.S. I am Lloyd Pinto, partner heading the U.S. tax practice for Grant Thornton India. For this webinar, we have collaborated with uh, Kaplan and Drysdale. They are a law firm based out of Washington, D.C., and also have an office in New York. We have with us today two very distinguished tax attorneys and speakers, Mark Matthews and Diane Mehani, who will be sharing their insights and experience in a short while from now on this webinar. During my interactions with U.S. citizens and green card holders living in India, over the years I have noticed that while most people do have a broad understanding that they need to file taxes in the U.S. even if they are living in India, in many such interactions what we found is that the understanding is not always complete. And we have seen many cases where people have only reported their U.S. income on the U.S. tax returns and have not offered their Indian income. In some instances, although the Indian income has been offered, it has not been completely offered or not correctly offered. In other scenarios, we have seen people file their tax returns, but they have not filed their FBARs. Hence, the overall objective of this webinar is to highlight the key tax filing obligations for U.S. citizens and green card holders who are living in India, and also to talk about why it is so important to be fully compliant. Later in this webinar, my friends from Kaplan and Drysdale will talk about the importance of being compliant. Most of you would already have filled out some sort of FATCA reporting, and it is important to know that the IRS is trying to gather as much information as they can about the assets of Americans who are living overseas. Hence, it is more important now than ever before to ensure that you are in full compliance. While we've only heard scary stories about the IRS, we have some good things to share as well. In case you realize that there are some aspects where you've not been fully compliant, later in today's webinar, uh, we will be discussing few options on how to get back into full U.S. tax compliance and hopefully in some cases without, you know, much taxes or penalties. With this overview, let us dive right into our topic for today. The Internal Revenue Service is the U.S. agency that taxes individuals at the federal level. Of course, there are separate tax codes at each state level which deal with individual taxes as well. If you are living in India, however, and do not have any U.S. sourced income, you will most likely have no tax filing obligations at the state level, and you would only need to file your 1040, which is your federal tax return. One of the key cornerstones of U.S. taxes for individuals is the fact that U.S taxes its residents on their worldwide income or global income. While seemingly very straightforward in concept, this basic fact eludes a lot of people, particularly those living in India, as the tax regulations here in India are different. If you leave India for a certain time frame and spend time overseas, about six to eight months, you will be treated as an Indian, you will be treated as a non-resident for Indian tax purposes. And thus, you would not have to pay taxes in India on your overseas income. However, if you are a U.S. citizen or a green card holder, you will be considered as a tax resident for U.S. tax purposes, even if you don't spend any time in the U.S. This is a very basic but important fact that many people have overlooked. Even today, I come across many cases where this is news to people. 
Moving on, in addition to tax returns, U.S. residents also need to file what is known as the FBAR, or the Foreign Bank and Financial Assets Reporting. This covers all your financial assets, such as bank accounts, securities accounts, equities, mutual funds, etc. You also have to report accounts where you just have a signatory authority. For example, if you have a signing authority over your company's bank account where you are employed, but you don't own any equity, you will still have to include such accounts. Any account where you hold a power of attorney will also have to be reported since you have a signing authority over those accounts. While this reporting by itself is not very difficult to comply, we believe that the awareness levels about the FR reporting are considerably low. And it's one of the key missing items that we have come across in terms of non-compliance. The consequences of not filing an FR report, however, is quite severe. And the penalties can add up to a sizable amount very quickly. With the introduction of FATCA, a new reporting obligation in Form 8938 was also introduced somewhere back in 2011. You have to report specified foreign financial assets on this form. While this is very similar to the FBAR, it does require certain additional information to be reported that is not there on the FBAR. Of course, if you own other businesses or if you have settled trusts or you are beneficiaries of trusts in India, there are a whole set of additional compliances that you need to deal with. So if you have any investment vehicles or trust structures, please ensure that you are doing all the necessary reporting associated with such entities. In addition to income tax, of course, there is the estate and gift tax regulations that U.S. tax residents also have to deal with. Now, while U.S. citizens or residents can make tax-free tax -free gifts of up to $14,000 per donee per year, Anything above this limit would be subject to the U.S. gift tax. The current exclusion from estate tax, the lifetime exclusion, is around $5.5 million. This amount is indexed for inflation each year, goes up slightly. There are, of course, talks by the Trump administration uh, that they want the estate taxes to be repealed, or at least the exemption threshold to go up. However, we still need to wait and watch what translates into legislation. Moving on to the next portion of our webinar, we will talk through how the U.S. IRS taxes certain kinds of income. We will specifically talk about income arising from Indian sources and how these sources of income would be taxed in the U.S. and whether you will get tax credits on the various kinds of income. So moving to the first income source that we are dealing with, that is interest. Now generally interest income is included in your ordinary income and it's taxed at the applicable tax rates or the tax slabs that is applicable to each taxpayer. In the U.S. certain interest incomes are also exempt from tax certain bonds which are issued by federal or state governments, the interest on such bonds are not taxed in the U.S. But most of the interest income in India would be taxable. You will need to offer this on your U.S. tax returns. You will, however, get a tax credit against your U.S. tax liability for the taxes that you may have paid in India on such interest income. So more or less, you should get a full offset of the Indian taxes that you have paid on your interest. If your effective tax rate in the U.S. is slightly higher, if you are in the 39.6% bracket, you will probably have incremental taxes that you would owe to the U.S. government. So that is the only thing you will need to factor into. But you should be able to get full credit for the taxes that you would pay in India on your interest income. Moving on to the next slide, we will talk about dividend income. In the U.S., generally dividends are taxed and classified under two categories. We have ordinary dividends and qualified dividends. 
Ordinary dividends are generally taxed as ordinary income and they are taxed at the applicable tax labs. Qualified dividends, however, have a lower rate of tax depending on your overall income. Uh, the rate of tax on qualified dividends could either be zero or it could go up to a maximum of 20%. Generally, if you have income from dividend sources from Indian equities, you would probably be aware that India does not tax dividend in the hands of the shareholders if the company pays what is known as a dividend distribution tax. So a lot of dividend income from Indian sources is generally exempt in India, and taxpayers usually don't pay any taxes on that dividend income in India. However, if you are a U.S. resident, you need to be aware that you will need to pay taxes in the U.S. on such dividend income. Dividends from Indian companies should generally qualify or be classified as qualified dividends. So you should be eligible for the lower tax rates applicable to qualified dividends. However, since no taxes are usually paid in India on such income, there will be no tax credits forthcoming on such dividend income. So this is an element where you need to be careful about. So if you have exempt dividends in India, please make sure that you report this income in your U.S. tax returns, give it to your accountant or CPA who is filing your U.S. taxes. Just because it is exempt in India, do not fail to include it in your U.S. tax return. The India-U.S. tax treaty does not provide any relief on dividends from Indian companies, so it is taxable uh, at the U.S. Uh, applicable tax rate. The next slide, we will talk about capital gains. Tax on capital gains depends on nature of the capital asset that we are talking about. We will deal with your primary residence capital gains slightly later in this webinar. In case of any other capital gain, the way it is computed, it's usually the sale price over the cost. What you need to be aware from a U.S. perspective, though, is that the gain will be computed in dollar terms. Usually in India, we are used to taking what we call an indexation benefit. The cost price of your capital asset is indexed for inflation. Unfortunately, that's an Indian rule. Similar rules are not available in the U.S. So there will be no indexation benefit when you are computing capital gains for U.S. tax purposes. Having said that, if it's an Indian asset, you will still need to compute the capital gain in dollar terms for computing gains to be reported on your U.S. tax return. So since the dollar has moved in only one direction, so you should get some benefit of the movement of the dollar, and that should give you some benefit which is similar to the indexation. Uh, but you will not get the exact indexation benefit. So the tax rate on capital gains, again, depends on your overall income levels, but at the maximum level is 20%. In addition to the basic capital gains tax rate, there is also the net investment income tax, which is a surcharge of 3.8%. Basically, the Obamacare taxes that we usually refer to, that will be over and above the capital gains tax. So that is what will be applicable on capital gains that will arise from Indian sources. Moving specifically to the next slide, we will talk about capital gains on equity shares. If you have listed equity in India, and if you've held it for over a year, you would be aware that long-term capital gains on listed equity would not be taxed in India because we have an exemption. Again, this is an Indian benefit, so if you have to report these capital gains in the U.S., they will be taxed at U.S. capital gains tax rates that we just discussed. If you have unlisted equity, on unlisted equity, most likely it is going to be taxable in India. The question then arises is how will the U.S. tax rules give you a credit for the taxes that you have paid? on such unlisted equity capital gains. Now here is where it gets a bit tricky. The U.S. defines 
the source of sale of capital gains or the source of capital gains where the seller is resident. So if you have a US resident seller, the capital gains on the sale of shares will be considered to be US source income and therefore the US will not give you a foreign tax credit on such taxes paid. There is however an exemption or an exception rather if you have a tax home outside the US. So if you are predominantly living in India paying taxes in India and most of your ties are in India, you should more or less be able to qualify for having an Indian tax home. In that scenario, you should be able to resource these capital gains as foreign source and therefore be able to claim foreign tax credits. So this is an area where you have to be very careful. So if you have capital gains on sale of shares, we need to ensure whether the taxpayer has a tax home in the US or outside the US. If you're living in the US and have a tax home in the US, most likely you will not be able to get the foreign tax credit. However, if you're living in India and your tax home is considered to be India, there is a possibility for you to take tax credits on your capital gains income from the sale of shares. Moving on to the next hot topic where we see a lot of clients uh, trip up, so to speak, is mutual funds. Unfortunately, the way Indian mutual funds are structured, they would get classified as passive foreign investment companies. The US has a very different tax regime for PFIX as they are known. They are not taxed at capital gains tax rates, but they are taxed at ordinary income tax rates. And there are certain punitive interest charges that are applicable in certain scenarios if you hold Indian mutual funds. So this is an area where taxpayers need to be very careful. You generally have two options on how you want to pay taxes on the mutual funds that you own. You can either choose to pay taxes only when you sell or dispose your mutual funds, or you may decide to pay taxes on an annual basis. And I will shortly explain what the difference in taxes would be under those two scenarios. So if you opt to treat your mutual fund as what is called a 1291 fund, that means you choose to pay taxes only in the year in which you dispose these mutual funds. If you do that, you will pay taxes in the year when you sell the mutual fund, but the gains will be prorated over the entire period of holding. And there is an additional interest and in tax that is computed for the prior years. And you end up paying what's an effective tax rate of more than 50 to 60% depending on how long you held the mutual fund. So just to give you an example, if you held a mutual fund for 10 years and say you make a $1,000 capital gain on the sale of mutual fund, the U.S. will treat this $1,000 gains as having been earned equally over the 10-year period. And what they're trying to say is for the 10th preceding year, you're paying us taxes almost 10 years late. So we will charge you a tax plus an interest for all those 10 years for the deferral in tax that you have done. So that way the taxes and the interest adds up and effectively the final tax rate on the sale of mutual fund could effectively go up to 50 to 60% depending on how long you've held. So this is an option which is dangerous in the sense your taxes could go quite high. So you need to be careful about those. So what if you don't want to pay these incremental taxes on mutual funds? The other option that you have is to choose to pay taxes on an annual basis on a mark-to-market regime. So you basically make a mark-to-market election and you decide to pay taxes on the annual increase in the mark-to-market value of your mutual funds. The upside of this is you only pay taxes or you pay taxes for the current year increase in the mutual fund value. There is no interest element because you are not deferring any taxes, you are pay, paying taxes every year. 
However, the downside is you still have to pay taxes whether or not you have sold your mutual funds. So you may not have the liquidity to pay taxes because you have not sold your assets, but in order to avoid the incremental interest charge, you decide to pay taxes annually. So mark-to-market election is an option to mitigate the interest exposure. However, you will still have probably a liquidity issue because you've not sold your investments yet. You have to pay taxes on those. Moving on to the next slide, we talk about rental income. Rental, rental income is slightly straightforward. They're taxed as ordinary income at your regular slab rates. There are deductible expenses that you can claim against such rental income, such as mortgage interest, property taxes, and so on and so forth. The key difference between US and India on the taxation of rental income is the ability to claim depreciation. In India, you would not get the benefit of depreciation on your rental asset. The US, however, gives you this benefit, so you will get a deduction from rental income on the depreciation that you can claim on such assets. So effectively, what that does is whatever taxes you would pay in India on your rental income should more or less be sufficient to cover your US taxable rental income because your deductions in the US will be much larger than your Indian deductions and your taxable rental income in the US would be on the lower side. Talking about capital gains on sale of real estate, so you decide to sell the uh, no real estate that you own. Uh, two options there or other two categories there, if it is your primary residence, then there are certain benefits. Uh, there, are, there is an exemption up to $500,000 for married taxpayers. So only the gain in excess of $500,000 would be taxable at the capital gains tax rate of 20%. Anything below that would be exempt. So that is a benefit if you're selling your primary home. Of course, there are certain conditions that you need to look at to determine whether or not you can call uh, that particular real estate your primary residence. So that needs to be taken care. Short-term capital gain on sale of real estate would be taxed at your ordinary income tax whatever tax slabs are applicable to the taxpayer, they would be taxed at those rates. Again, while you sell a real estate in India, you will be eligible for indexation benefits. Similar benefits are not available in the US. However, since the gain is being computed in dollar terms, you will get the benefit of the movement in the dollar. So your gain in dollar terms might be slightly lower. So no indexation benefits similar to India, but you will get the exchange exchange fluctuation benefits because of the way the dollar has moved in the last few years. So just to wrap up my portion, just wanted to give you a sense of what the typical tax rates are in the US that are applicable to various taxpayers. As you can see on the slide, this is the tax rates that are applicable for the 2016 tax year for somebody who is filing as a single taxpayer. If your tax classification is single, you will start at a 10% tax rate and the peak tax rate will be 39.6, about $415,000. If you move on to the next slide, we have the tax slabs that are applicable to married filing jointly. So if you're married, you can file a joint return along with your spouse. You will get the benefit of slightly expanded tax slabs. Again, the base tax, slab, tax rate is 10%, and above 466,000 approximately, you will hit the top tax bracket in the US. So I'll now hand over uh, the mic to Mark and Diane to take over their portion for the webinar. Over to you, Mark and Diane. Thank you very much, uh, Lloyd. Um, um, I, I thank you and Grant Thornton for inviting us to attend this uh, webinar, and thanks to everyone uh, who's taken time from their evening to participate. We can go ahead and move to slide 18. 
what, what we have seen uh, starting probably eight or nine years ago, but much more dramatically over the last five years, is the increasing globalization and financial transparency that really, you know, sort of the efforts started in the United States, but it really is coming across the globe now. It began uh, sort of in the United States out of uh, the concern about, and particularly Swiss and other tax havens, you know, having accounts for U.S. citizens who were living in the United States and who were not reporting their income and were the most deliberate types of tax evasion. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But what happened is because the U.S. had some, sec some success there, they uh, enacted a statute called FATCA, or the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Now, uh, Diane and I uh, and our firm have, have been critics uh, in many ways of, of some of the aggressiveness of the U.S. behavior here, and we in particular see FATCA is, is uh, very inefficient and overbroad in many ways, and we've worked in the United States to try to to try to uh, help on that, but it's a fact of life, and as you know, it basically is a, an effort to seek out accounts and assets by U.S. persons, and it's while it might have been directed primarily to U.S. persons living in the United States, it also will catch U.S. persons who live abroad. And I was frankly surprised. Um, I, I spent quite a bit of time in my life in the Internal Revenue Service, and I would have thought uh, this would not catch on and be resisted, but far from it, the rest of the world sort of decided this was a good thing and then came up with its own common reporting standard. This became a topic for the group of 20, and OECD uh, has taken up this. So uh, to my surprise, this has sort of become a global phenomenon and where all of these governments are recognizing they need more revenues, and they're recognizing that due to globalization and people's rapid movement, there may be either willful, you know, deliberate tax evasion, or as we're finding more and more, non-willful, innocent circumstances where people just didn't understand. Again, this all started with the U.S. government, um, and the U.S. government had, had had traditional efforts in treaty exchanges and the like, and those over the years did not work so well. But in recent years, because of all this phenomenon, um, you're seeing much more aggressive and, and much more productive uses of treaties to follow cases. There was also the Swiss bank program, which was essentially a voluntary disclosure program for Swiss banks to come in and avoid um, uh, their own prosecution troubles. But as a price of that, they turned over enormous amounts of data on their bank accounts. Uh, it caused many of these people to go into the voluntary disclosure program, but the U.S. government is now following the people. Many people fled those Swiss banks um, in sort of the early part of the decade. They saw that what was going on here and tried to flee uh, to other jurisdictions, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Israel, you know, you name it, uh, and the government is following those. In addition, there were over 100,000 people who have done some sort of voluntary disclosure in the United States, and all those people were subject to interviews. So they're following those interviews, they're creating big databases, and they're looking at the not only the banks and the trust companies and the lawyers or the professionals, those give them leads to new cases where there may be U.S. persons. We've also seen a lot of private activity. There are whistleblowers. The IRS pays, um, can pay very high um, fees to whistleblowers to turn in information on U.S. persons. Now, at one level, this could be as simple as a spouse, one spouse, you know, reporting on another. But what we've seen more is it could be someone at a bank, some junior person, and even in the information technology area, who says, wait a second, I have all these files. I can get our U.S. people. Let me turn that into the IRS, and I'll be able to retire because I'll make so much money on that. So that's been a big incentive. You have people leaking in general and other media efforts, like the inter there's an international consortium of journalists, and you've seen reports on the Panama Papers. So all this is to say it's sort of a very dangerous time uh, if someone 
thinks they can hide and that the best thing they can do is just not uh, come forward. Now, we're about to go over some of the ways to um, um, resolve this, and the truth is we have worked with Grant Thornton and depended on them greatly for, the, for investigating the tax aspects of these cases, but we find that increasingly there are uh, reasonable ways for the taxpayer to come back into compliance. They're, most of our clients are not those deliberate people who have the Swiss bank account with the Liechtenstein Trust, who deal only in cash, and who have told their uh, return preparation falsehoods, right? There are those people, and even those people can be protected. They can avoid any criminal prosecution. They can avoid likely publicity. They pay higher fines, though, and have to um, – Diane's going to go over this um, – um, um, uh, um, so there are those people that do exist, but as long as they knock on the IRS door before the IRS knocks on their door, they can be protected. But more and more, our people are much more innocent. They didn't realize or they were negligent. They've gotten behind. They didn't think they would owe much U.S. tax because of, um, you know, uh, credits and that kind of thing. And, but some of those people want to get cleaned up. You know, they may have children in the United States. They may want to keep a U.S passport, whatever it is. So that's increasingly what we're seeing. Uh, Lloyd, if we can go to 19, slide 19. Just because I've mentioned the scary part, there are criminal sanctions, and for the and these are for the people again who have deliberately, knowingly, and usually over many years, you know, concealed taxes and income from the United States. So we have a there's a tax evasion statute. There's just filing a false return. Uh, there is conspiracy. Um, these all are, are felonies, and they could come with jail sentences and fines. There is even a, a failure to file the FBAR form that, that, that Lloyd was talking about. A willful failure to file that is also a felony. The conspiracy charge is very powerful in the United States because um, – it allows the statute of limitations to go very far back in time. Uh, it, it allows a lot of evidence to come in, and the prosecutors use that in the United States to sort of get everybody. It's not only the taxpayer, but they're particularly focused on the professionals, right? The accountants, lawyers, trust companies who may be deliberately and knowingly helping people conceal. So that's where they're headed. Ironically, the sentences in these cases have been relatively low. Still, more than half the people get probation in the United States. About 200 individuals have been charged. The vast majority of those were taxpayers, and many dozens, though, were like classically Swiss bankers or lawyers. But on average, this sentence is probation. And even in a case that our firm handled, uh, Ty Warner, which until a, a few weeks ago, in another case we handled, was the largest case in the country. He had a $120 million foreign bank account. If, if you ever heard of the Beanie Baby toy, which got very famous in the United States back in the 90s, he was the creator of that. He uh, pled guilty, and even though it was a $120 million account, he received a sentence of probation, largely because he had given such good charitable activities. But these are very powerful criminal tools. Slide 20, even if the government doesn't choose the criminal weapon, and, that it, and it is relatively rare, right? There are millions of people out of some sort of tax compliance, and they're only going to bring hundreds of cases. So, you know, very sorry for the people who uh, – are caught and you don't want to be that person, but most people face civil sanctions. And here on this page, you can just see some of what's going on civilly. There are audits occurring out of these disclosures. There can be an accuracy penalty of 20% of the tax that was omitted or a fraud, up to a fraud penalty. Now, that's a civil fraud of 75% of the penalties. There, the, the Internal Revenue Code is just 
full of penalties. Not only are those that work on percentages, but almost all of them have a non-willful penalty that's $10,000. And you know, if you start to have a few foreign bank accounts and some forms missing, very quickly it can get very expensive. Now Diane's going to talk about some programs in a minute that allow you even to avoid these sorts of penalties, again, if you knock on their door first. There are uh, significant penalties around trust, uh, and there's some forms uh, that are required to file those. The FBAR penalty, that's the government's nuclear weapon. If they can show that someone knew about the FBAR form, knew they were supposed to file it, and didn't, now that's a pretty high burden, uh, but if they could show that, the penalty can be 50% of the high balance in that bank account, and it can go for actually several years, although the government has basically said in an ordinary case they will settle for one single 50% FBAR penalty. As I mentioned, there are over 100,000 people who have already disclosed uh, in the United States. Um, and there are the, uh, these other efforts continue to chase them in, including a global high net worth where the government's looking at people of high incomes and really focusing on them. So these are all the reasons why one should, uh, should help your clients consider alternatives. We don't want to be someone who's dealing with these possible criminal and civil sanctions. There is an easier way, and Diane's going to start discussing some of those. So Diane? Thank you, Mark. Um, we are moving to slide 21. And as he noted, there are a variety of programs that the IRS has introduced to allow people who have historically either failed to comply entirely with their U.S. tax ob filing obligations or have had a foot fault. So people who have filed returns for years but maybe had not included all of their income, their sources of income, either purposefully or because, as Lloyd has spent time discussing, that the tax rules that apply in the U.S. vary quite distinctly from the tax rules in India and some of the other foreign countries. So there are a few programs that have been introduced. The first one we'll discuss a little bit is the Voluntary Disclosure Program. As noted by Mark, this program really was introduced as a type of amnesty program. The IRS doesn't refer to it as such, but it's kind of seen as a trade-off. The IRS or the Department of Justice agrees that it's not going to prosecute you criminally for failing to report non-U.S. income or non-U.S. assets, and in turn, you agree to file a fairly hefty penalty and file tax returns for a number of years. Now, the important parts of the Voluntary Disclosure Program are you must be coming in to report legally sourced income. If you are a drug runner or some other type of um, entrepreneur, the voluntary disclosure program will not apply to you, will not be offered to you if you have non-legal income. There are other things that we could discuss in a different, a different time for options for disclosure in that case, but you cannot enter the voluntary disclosure program. The most important part of the OVDP, as we call it, is that it must be timely. You must come to the U.S. and enter the voluntary disclosure program. You do something called filing for preclearance, where you send a fax with your name, address, and some other identifying information to the criminal division of the Internal Revenue Service, and they do a background check to ensure they don't already have your name. As Mark referenced some of the ways that the IRS can learn about you, the Swiss Bank program, a whistleblower, you know, a disgruntled employee, if the IRS learns it has your name before you come in, you cannot enter into the voluntary disclosure program. In that case, OVDP is off the table for you and you'd have to seek other um, options. So you must be timely, and this is particularly relevant right now with the dawning of FATCA and the implementation across the world. A lot of our clients come to us because they receive a letter from a bank saying, we noticed you were born in the United States, or you know, we, we noticed that you 
um, have income from the United States, that you have multiple transfers from the United States. Are you U.S.? We're going to give your name to the U.S. government to comply with FACA. That is usually the starting point. And a lot of times our clients come to us before then and say, what do I do? And in some instance, the voluntary disclosure program is appropriate. So you need to knock on their door before they come to you. And of course, you must be truthful and complete, and you must comply fully. This is particularly um, relevant in recent days because the IRS has started requesting interviews from participants in OVDP. The IRS is seeking facilitators, not really the underlying taxpayers. If you're in a bank that has a large number of voluntary disclosures, the IRS might say, you know, maybe this bank was complicit, maybe they were helping in some way, we're going to interview. You must um, agree to that interview and fully comply, and of course, good faith arrangements to pay the tax interest and penalties that will be due. Um, one of the key things to note, even if you're requested an interview, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to come to the United States. All of the programs that we're discussing, the Voluntary Disclosure Program and then the Streamline Program in other ways, it does not require a taxpayer to visit the United States. You have to comply fully in written documents and sometimes um, comply with a phone interview, but more often than not, you're not being asked to even be interviewed and you're just filing um, documents, you're signing documents under penalties of perjury, and we and Grant Thornton are submitting them on your behalf. So it doesn't require coming to the U.S. So on to slide 22. Some of the details of the Voluntary Disclosure Program, it, it does have a large number of years involved. You have to file eight years of tax returns, and you must file, pay the interest and the penalties. If you have never filed um, a tax return, then the penalties are up to 50% of the tax due. If you're just amending tax returns, it's 20% of the tax due. But that is due when you file those returns, that payment. Um, you also have to file your information returns, of course your FBARs, but also if you're a beneficiary of any foreign trust, if your clients are you know, part of family-held companies where 5471s will be required, all of those must be filed for your eight years as well. Uh, and you also um, must uh, file any t estate or gift tax returns that are due. So we have put people in the program who a family member comes to us and says, oh, my dad died, and when he died, we realized that there was this vast amount of wealth of which we previously had no knowledge. Well, we can put that person, even though deceased, in the voluntary disclosure program and also wrap up some of the estate tax issues with it, which, of course, criminal protection isn't always as important for the person who has died, but for the beneficiaries that come behind, there are a number of laws that are criminally applicable to beneficiaries who know of unpaid taxes and still receive distributions or executors and the like, and the Voluntary Disclosure Program is an excellent way to cover that and to clean up the past, move forward, all criminal off the table. Um, of course, as we've already noticed, noted, the disclosure programs have a large number of participants and have really been quite lucrative from the U.S. point of view, but they do offer a great level of protection and closure for people who choose this program. If you go to slide 23, a few of the um, particulars a little bit more um, in depth there. As we noted, you have to file preclearance where you name the financial institutions in which you have assets and then ensure that the IRS does not have your name. Then the most information and really the, the point of no return for a client is when you file the intake letter. The intake letter is when you provide all of the detail of your foreign assets, their origination, you have to quantify, even if only an estimate, the amount of unpaid tax you may have. And, and really provide the details of the interactions you had with the bank, et cetera. So at that point, you're giving the IRS a roadmap of all of your noncompliance, so we recommend that at that point you decide are you going to stay in the program or not. The end of it is a certification process. So you're filing your intake letter and then your eight years of amended returns or, or unfiled returns with information, and then it's information returns, and then it's assigned to an IRS agent. Now, some agents receive that package, they do a little tick and tie, ask one or two small questions, and they're done. 
they're, they're closing it and you're paying the penalty, which we'll discuss in a moment. Some agents actually do a very deep review, not unlike an audit, where they will ask um, detailed list of questions, um, they will go back and forth a couple of times. They'll ask for backup documentation on any tax return positions you've taken. And so we counsel our clients on the front end that it, it wildly varies with agents and it is not indicative of whether your disclosure will be accepted or not. As long as you fully cooperate, you are getting that criminal amnesty and you're going to reach closure. It's just agent dependent on how much information they need before they close it. Going to slide 24, some of the things we've already discussed, and of course Lloyd has really discussed already, the PFIC mark-to-market regime that's still in place, and we work with him quite extensively to ensure those calculations are done properly. As we noted again, if you're amending returns, you'll, file a, you'll pay a 20% accuracy-related penalty on the additional tax due. If you've never filed returns, which some of our clients um, are in that situation, the, the penalty for that unpaid tax is upwards of 50%, so it is quite high, and then you pay interest on both of those. The biggest part of the Voluntary Disclosure Program, and, and one of the main reasons a lot of our clients choose the streamlined programs, which we'll discuss in a moment, is that at the end, you must pay a, what we call an offshore penalty, an FBAR penalty. And this penalty is imposed on all of the offshore assets that were out of tax compliance, had um, un, you know, unrealized income, and were not disclosed to the U.S. And so that is broader than just the assets that would be reported on your FBAR. So it's broader than just financial accounts. So for instance, a lot of our clients come to us and they own real estate that is income producing or that was purchased with non-disclosed funds. That's a key distinction. If you have a plot of empty land sitting there, it's not earning any income, but you purchase that land with income you've earned for years and have never disclosed to the IRS. The IRS pulls that plot of land into the penalty base to impose that asset, excuse me, that penalty. Um, we have a lot of clients who are beneficiaries of trusts or family-held companies. If you have not reported income earned from those, those vehicles, then your portion of the vehicle will be subject to the penalty. Now, the penalty is either 27.5% of the value of all of these assets or 50%. Um, perhaps of lesser application to our, our listeners today, the 50% penalty is, is typically imposed on a lot of the Swiss banks that have come into this Swiss bank program that Mark discussed, but there are other financial institutions and third-party um, institutions on the list. It's published uh, monthly, I believe by the Department of Justice, and we can look online and see whether, you know, an institution in which you have funds is on that list, but that jumps it to 50%, and the key here is it's not just 50% on the assets you hold in that institution, it's 50% of all of your undisclosed assets. So you can see that for some of our clients, they come to us, they have an initial conversation and realize 27.5% or 50% of my entire wealth, essentially, especially for some of our clients who have lived outside the United States for years and years, and, and really most of their wealth is amassed outside its borders. They say, this is, this is a non-starter. I cannot enter into this program. And specifically, I'm not a criminal. You know, I didn't know about my filing obligations, or maybe I even knew of them, but I always intended to comply, surely I'm not the person for which this program is designed. So then we move to slide 25. And the good news is there is a program designed for that client. Um, the streamlined filing compliance procedures, um, which actually Kaplan and Drysdale met with the IRS a uh, number of times and suggested offering an alternate path. You know, we, we work closely with the government and we made a point to say, look, not everyone is the Ty Warner who's, you know, hiding his large account, you know, and, and doing the Beanie Babies and sitting on, you know, upwards of $100 million and just not filing 
complete tax returns. We have a number of clients who either were born outside the U.S. but are U.S. citizens and maybe didn't even realize it, or they had green cards and moved away 10, 15 years ago and just failed to keep filing, or even people that really knew they should file and always intended to file someday, but maybe they thought it wasn't that important because maybe they live in a higher tax jurisdiction, or maybe they just assumed, you know, I own, you know, I'll owe one or two thousand dollars of tax a year, even ten or fifteen thousand. Is it really that big a deal? I'll figure it out someday. You know, I'm I'm working hard. I'm trying to live my life. I don't have time to deal with this. Those type of people shouldn't pay this exorbitant penalty imposed by the OBDP. Well, this is what the streamlined is for. It's designed for non-willful U.S. tax filers. Non-willful is defined as someone who had inadvertence, good faith mistake of law, or even gross negligence. You know, we have had a number of IRS um, IRS employees who have noted in conferences that, you know, even extreme negligence can still constitute non-willfulness. Now, we have two types of programs that are available through Streamlined. One offers a 0% penalty, which, of course, all of our clients say, sign me up, that is the program I want. But there is a very strict requirement, and that is you must live abroad. Um, to qualify. Now, what does live abroad mean? That means when you look back at the last three filing years, so since 2016 filing deadline hasn't passed, we would look at 15, 14, and 13, and we would say in 15 and 14 and 13, were you outside of the, U were you inside the U.S. for less than 35 days in any one of those years? So the client says, yes, in 2014, I only spent 20 days in the U.S. 13 and 15, I was here a lot, but in 14, I was only 20 days. Great, you qualify for the first prong. Second prong, do you have a U.S. abode? They say, no, you know, when I'm in the U.S., I stay with my aunt, or I stay in a hotel, or, you know, I have an apartment that's usually rented out, but sometimes I stay in it. All of those are good answers. You do not have a U.S. abode. It's a very fact-specific definition, and it's, it's really quite broad. So for that person, great, you qualify for the 0% penalty so long as you, of course, were non-willful. Now, someone else comes in and says, well, unfortunately, in the past three years, I was in the U.S. for, you know, 60 days each year. Unfortunately, you cannot enter into the 0% um, streamlined filing program because it is a hard stop. There are no exceptions. There are no facts and circumstances. If you're there more than 35 days for each of the three years, you're barred from that one. But you do have an option available to you which imposes a 5% penalty. Still a little painful if you have someone that has, you know, um, you know, a family company or a trust beneficiary, something like that, with assets not in tax compliance, but much more palatable than the 27.5% or even 50%. The best news about streamlined filing is you are only filing three years of tax returns. So if we go to slide 26, you will see that in the program, you file amended returns or original returns if you qualify for the 0% penalty. Um, we'll talk about a little variation with the 5% penalty if you've never filed a return in a moment. But you file amended return or original return only for three years. Now, you file information returns, you know, your FBARs, um, actually only your FBARs, you file those for six years. And if you're in the 5% penalty camp, then you look at that six-year history to, in, to decide what penalty applies. But it's, it's much less tax that will be due. And most importantly, you file a detailed statement. And this is where we work quite a bit, Kaplan and Drysdale works quite a bit with our clients to look at that detailed statement to really round out your reasons. What is your background, your filing history, and what is the reason why? You know, I was really busy running my company. Maybe somebody was sick. Maybe I had twins. Maybe I just thought I wouldn't owe tax because I was in a higher tax jurisdiction. All of those are reasons that need to be fleshed out and explained. Uh, the key exception with the streamlined is there is no criminal protection. This is designed for the entrance 
uh, the um, person who does not have criminal exposure. This isn't the Ty Warner who opened his Swiss bank account. This is the person that really just wasn't paying attention or just has an excuse for why he was doing it. He doesn't have the Liechtenstein Foundation, et cetera. Um, one of the things we have to counsel our clients is you don't get the closure with Streamlined that you receive in OVDP. You file that package of returns in your statement and you may never hear from the IRS again. And really the, the longest, the longer we go without hearing anything, the better things are. Um, but we will note that the truthfulness is very, very important because we have had Sometimes the IRS comes through to ask questions, and so we need to be mindful to be as complete as we can because the DOJ is reviewing what they call bad streamlined. So on to um, slide 27 in our remaining minutes. We do have people that fall through the gaps. Um, when I noted that 5% program, there are people who have been in the U.S. for more than 35 days a year, but they've never filed returns. For people like them, there isn't a clear path in the Streamline because in the Streamline program, the 5% option, you have to file amended returns, not original return. So Mark, what are some of the options we can offer for our clients who, who don't qualify for any of the programs, but they're, they're not really criminals? Yeah, there are some difficult ones, and 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 those are where it really makes sense to get with um, an accounting firm and probably to get a law firm quickly so that the conversations can be privileged. And we can be very fle we can be very flexible. Sometimes we tell people, let's go ahead and try. Let's let's go ahead and file and raise our hand and ask to be treated more leniently. Um, there are some circumstances if the amount of back income is so low. Um, and if other facts and circumstances are good, there are some clients, there are slides we won't go to at the end here, who can, can theoretically consider going forward only. In other words, they would just start filing true and accurate returns and could assess that even, even if they were selected for audit, and that may be unlikely and maybe they get lucky, that we could file, we could defend it then. And so that's a very difficult analysis and you need to, you need to be dealing with people who have a lot of experience with the IRS, but for some people in some circumstances with very low income, that may be the way to go. Diane, do you want to talk about just to I could say a couple of words about expatriation sometimes too? We we need to have some time for questions, so I'll just oh, note if we yeah, have sure clients we. that if we have clients that um, are looking to really sever their ties with the U.S., expatriation is a wonderful option if they have a dual citizenship. And it's, it's important here because a lot of times we package that up into the streamlined filing. The streamlined filing requires only three years, but you must certify five years of compliance when you expatriate. So we often will throw in a few extra returns so you can get to that five years and just note in the cover letter that our client is looking to expatriate and this is how they're rectifying their noncompliance. And that has been routinely accepted. So it's a great option for someone who would, who would would like to not file in the U.S. anymore. So Lloyd, over to you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, uh, Mark and Dan. Uh, we've received several questions. I'm not sure we'll be able to cover all of them, uh, but do not worry. We will try to respond to each of your questions uh, on email. But we'll just quickly take uh, a few questions uh, right now while we have Mark and Diane you know, on the call. So one of the first questions we have, and probably this is for you, Diane, what if all your income was disclosed and taxed fully, but you only missed filing the FBARs and do so now at this stage? Is there a financial penalty which would apply? That, that's a great question, Lloyd. And actually, there is a program specifically designed for you. It used to be called the FAQ-17. Now it's the Delinquent Information Filing Return Program, or the FBAR program. If you only missed filing FBARs, you just file those FBARs, we package them up a certain way, and the IRS um, agrees that if there's no unreported income, there is no penalty. If you missed filing 5471s or 3520s because you're the beneficiary of a trust or a company, something like that, and again, there's no unreported income, 
The difference is you must, um, you, you can file those and the IRS will review your filing and may not impose any penalty, usually does not impose any penalty, but in that filing you do have to attach a detailed reasonable cost statement. So we try to craft those very carefully. It's a higher bar than just I wasn't negligent. You have to really have a reason, but we've been very successful at filing those without the imposition of penalty. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Uh, is there an end date to the OVDP or streamline program? Uh, is there a sunset clause? Uh, it's Mark. I'll deal with that. No, there's not now, but the IRS has always reserved the right to end it at any time. So, um, you know, this is still a money maker for them. So I don't see any immediate concern, but there are no promises. Um, they, have, they have at times talked about ending OVDP. I think Streamline will be with us for a long time because it's so easy. It's file and forget. But, but anyone who has an issue should, should start to address it now. Don't wait too long. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mark. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, we'll just take one more. Does the immigration officer have tax records in their system? That's an interesting question. Mark? Uh, um, Diane I can, can chime in on this. Actually. Yeah, go, yes, Diane, go ahead. Yes. Um, the immigration officers do not have tax records specifically in their files. However, they do sometimes get notices from the IRS. If you reach a certain point where you're being collected upon, the IRS is after you for collections, then the uh, um, immigration will have your account flagged and will pull you aside until you can meet with an IRS person or the like. And there's also a new law that's been implemented that is either taking away your passport or stopping you from renewing from your passport if you are in a collection um, procedure with the IRS. So if the IRS knows you have unpaid taxes and has begun to come after you, there is a new act called the FAST Act, I believe, that will um, impede your opportunity to return to the U.S. and or renew your U.S. passport. Diane, okay, isn't there a fifty thousand dollar threshold for that? I, I think that's, but but yeah. again, it's it's a dangerous thing. You you don't want to come to the United States in doubt and then find out that you get turned turned back. Lloyd, do okay, you want to close us out? Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, thanks. That's all time we have for the questions. Uh, we will reach out to each one of the attendees who have sent in their questions. We will respond to you by email. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, on this webinar. Hope this has been helpful to you. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, and thanks, Mark and Diane, for uh, your time. And have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. With this, we conclude the session for today. Wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you, everyone, for joining in.